Now, um, I'm also pumped up and excited today because we're going to start a brand new series. And uh, I love the series that we're about to get into. We're about to get into a series called Happily Ever After, Building a Selfless Marriage. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to spend several weeks on this, uh, on this message, you know, because we really want to dive into what God says about marriage. Now, here's the reason that we're going to get into this, is that marriage truly is the most important relationship that we have outside of our relationship with God. In this world, that is the most important relationship. So we're going to talk about some amazing principles that we can apply from God's perspective that help us have the relationship, the marriage that God intended for us to have. But before we get started with that, would you please pray with me? Father, we just want to thank you so much for today. Thank you, Father, for, again, the opportunity that we get to talk about this important subject. Father, the most important relationship that we can have is with our spouse. And I pray that today we can look at those principles and learn how we can do it right. Father, if there's someone here right now that's single or someone who's been divorced, I help them to know that the best is yet to come. The Father, that you still have big plans for them and that you're, you know, who knows, right now maybe what's happening is you're doing something great in their life that's going to help them be ready for that perfect person that you're going to bring into their life. Not because that perf- person is perfect, but it's the one that you are matching up with them. And we thank you for that. And we pray, Father, for all of us who, who are married, that we can just continue to grow in our relationship with each other and continue to have that type of unselfish love that you want us to have for each other. Again, we thank you so much. Help us all of today to take our next step in our relationship with each other and also with you. Father, we pray this on our son, Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so again, if you want to take out your notes, you see that the title for today's message is Happily Ever After, Building a Selfless Marriage. So key number one, the first thing that you want to do is if you want to have a great marriage, first and foremost, or if you're a boyfriend-girlfriend situation right now, here's what you want to do. Make sure you get the tickets for the Valentine's dance when you leave today, okay? So that, that, that's first, all right? So that's, we're going to have a great time on, on Wednesday night here on Valentine's Day. So, so you can do that, that's number one. But, but seriously, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about this. And if you're here today and you're not married and you're wondering, great, you know, I came to church on this weekend, and he's going to go into a series on marriage. Why am I even going to be here for the next, you know, few weeks? You know, I'm telling you, please make sure you're here. Don't run out of here. If you're single, here's what this does. What this does for you today, it allows you to start with the right foundation. See, it, it's harder to take a house that's all crooked and put all the work and all the effort and everything you got to do to, reach, to fix the structure on that. It takes a lot of work. So if you're single right now, you get to actually start with the right foundation. So we're going to show you some principles on things that you can, that need to be important to you, that God says, here's what you, you know, what you need to do in your relationship. And then also, here is what you should look for in someone else. You know, because too often what we do is we make the wrong decision and we start dating somebody we shouldn't be dating. And part of the reason we do that is because we don't even we don't understand who we're supposed to date. What does God say are, is, are the important things that I should look for? We're going to talk all about that. So this prepares you there. Now, if you've been divorced and you think, well, it's too late for me. You know, I've already moved on. Listen, God is the God that can heal anything. And so ultimately is this, if your relationship is broken and it's beyond repair, you know what? Uh, What I want to show you is this, is that Albert Einstein said something that was incredible. He said that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. So what we want to do is this, is that if you've been divorced and that's gone, okay, you know, but now God's not done with you now. So now whoever God is going to bring into your life as you move forward, let's not do the same thing. Let's learn how to do it right so that this relationship will be built on the right foundation, on what God wants, you know, for your life. And for all of us who are married, we're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about ultimately what God wants out of husbands and wives. I'm telling you, I'm telling you this. It is life transforming. It will literally transform your relationship with your spouse. It is absolutely incredible. If you're right now going, I don't even like my spouse right now. Awesome. I mean, I'm not awesome that you feel that way. But but awesome that you're here, okay? We're going to get through that. We're going to do that. By the time we're done, hopefully you'll like them a little, okay? And, and so, so we're going to talk all about that. So the only person that this really isn't for is if you're like a celibate monk that's going to live up in the mountains, you know? So, and, so if you have the gift of celibacy, if the gift of celibacy means you have no attraction towards anyone, you know, physically, you know, intimately like that, if that's you, you know, hey, you can still be here because maybe you'll run into someone who does and you can actually walk, walk them through God's principles, all right? So, so again, we're going to talk about some great things today. And the first thing we're going to look at there on your notes, you can see, that the first thing is that marriage takes time and work. We have to be ready for that. Marriage takes time and work. See, we don't, we don't think about that too often, but it does. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of work to make a great marriage happen. My wife and I now have been married 19 years, one month, and two days. You know, so yeah, thank you. Thank you. You know, I, I love my wife. We have an amazing relationship. I mean, we keep growing together, closer, deeper in a relationship. You know, our, you know I, I mean, our, our passion for each other, everything continues to grow. I love that. You know, what I love is that, is that we're not done. We're going to just keep growing together. We're going to grow older together. We're going to spend more time together. We get, the more we get to know about each other, the more that we get to, to, to build each other up. I mean, it's incredible. 
But I got to tell you, you know, it took a lot of work, and it's not perfect yet. We're still working on this. There are times when we both have bad days, times when we don't want to do the right thing. The, the reality is we are, we are all broken people in a broken world, and sometimes we're going to have things that we have to work through. But here's the biggest thing that I want you to know about a relationship, is that a relationship will always grow. Every relationship grows. Every relationship. It will either grow closer together or it will grow apart. You know why? Because people change. See, as we grow and as we live our life, things are going to continue to grow and our relationships will grow. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the principles that God has so that we can grow together. Because what you put into a relationship, I promise you, later on is what you're going to get out of it. So what we're going to talk about, again, is, is how if you start planting something, if you plant an orange tree, guess what you're going to get later on? Not grapes. You're going to get oranges, right? So what we're going to talk about is planting the right things into your marriage, into your relationship. You know, if you're single, the, the things that you have to start looking at, start writing down. These are seeds, seeds to start planting. Because when that happens later on, you can then reap the benefit of an amazing, amazing marriage. So that's what we're going to be, we're going to be talking about. And the secret to it all is this. It's going to take time, and it's going to take work. And it's not going to be easy. I want you to know that. Because we're two different people, two different personalities. Things are going to happen. We're going to have, you know, issues that happen. We're going to butt heads sometimes. So because of that, it's not going to be easy. And society doesn't help it at all. See, right now society, the family unit is considered irrelevant, which is crazy. Because if you go back and you look at society and how broken it is and, and how, you know, people don't, you know, um, have all these relational issues, they don't realize that the reason is because they're trying to rip families apart. But every single one of us, we've all been impacted by Family's being ripped apart. I mean, if I did raise the hands, and I won't do it right now, but I think most of us have all been impacted by divorce, which is crazy. In society today, society doesn't just say, you know, hey, don't get divorced. They're like, yeah, whatever. If they don't make you happy, just move on. Just move. I don't even know how many times J-Lo's been married. I don't even know. I mean, she, you know, she doesn't change her name, so you don't know. It's, it's, you know but, the, but it's crazy. I mean, and it's celebrated that way. You know, it's like, hey, just keep moving on. Just keep moving on. But it truly is this, is that if we want to have a great relationship, we have to be able to handle the pressures of relationships. You know, and, and so I started looking up on Google, because Google never lies, right? And so, so on Google, I started looking up and said, okay, what, what are the things that cause marriages to fall apart? The, 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 most, the biggest things, the biggest issues that happen. Uh, number one, they said, was finances. That if you don't agree on your finances and you get to the point where you're in so in debt and you're drowning, that adds so much pressure, so much tension that it's hard to enjoy each other. You know, so people fall apart. You know, the other one was um, going through a, a very difficult hardship. You know, like, a, like the loss of a child. If you lose a child, you know, that's very difficult to overcome. You still can overcome it. And we're going to talk about that today, how you can overcome even the most difficult things. You know, my, my brother and sister-in-law, they, they lost a child, uh, you know, 19 years ago um, that died of, of cancer. Two years old, she died of cancer. And I remember it was, it was tough and it was difficult. But you know what? They're still married today, you know, 20-something years of marriage. And they're doing great because they base their foundation, their life, their relationship on what God says, not just what they were feeling at that time because you know what when that, something like that happens you don't feel anything you try to you're you, you're so overcome by grief that you try to numb yourself so so we're, so we're, we're going to talk about how regardless of what the enemy throws your way how you can have an amazing relationship that keeps moving forward and so I thought about that you know what is the biggest thing that that people get divorced over and I, I for me my number one thing I thought about I was like you know I think it's just driving together <laughs> man isn't that tough sometimes Okay, so I normally drive, okay? I normally drive the whole family. Um, and normally the reason is because I think my wife has like car narc narcoleptic, you know, because we, we get in the car. I kid you not, we live in Sawarita. It's only 11 miles to get to Tucson. By the time we get to Tucson, she's all, and she's out. I'm like, I'm not gonna let her drive. We're gonna die, you know? So, uh, you know, so I normally do drive. And then, um, but there are times where my wife is driven because I have to do something. And so she's driven. And I got to tell you, I'm a horrible passenger. I really am. You know, and so we're, we're, we know where we're going. She's going to drive us over to her mom's house. She's been there a million times. She knows where her mom's house is. And then I'll go, hey, babe, why don't you turn right here? Hey, babe, why don't you turn left here? Hey, babe, why don't you? Oh, wait, you're, you're following that car kind of close. You're following that car kind of close. And she looks at me with those loving eyes of, when you fall asleep, I'm going to suffocate you. You know, I mean. <laughs> I mean, so, so that's the thing. We know that. We know that. Those are the issues that happen in marriage, you know. So, but, but the thing is this, is there will be conflict in marriage. So how do you survive that? How do you survive whenever there's conflict and how are you able to get through it and have a stronger relationship because of the conflict? It's kind of like working out. 
When you work out, there's stress on your muscles, but you know what it does? It actually makes you stronger. Listen to this article from Christianity Today. It says this, Christianity Today asked couples who had faced real pressure in their marriage. I'm talking about a very hard, you know, financial hardship, um, you know, uh, w- whether it was a loss, of, a loss of, a, of a family member. And so if they, they talked to people who were going through some really stressful times, who faced real pressure in their marriage, uh, what kept them together? And they were all Christians. Nine out of ten people said the one thing that kept them together was the teaching in God's word about marriage. Plain and simple. Truth. Truth. Because they weren't feeling like staying together. But ultimately, going back to God's truth is what ended up fixing that relationship. And that one person, that was 9 out of 10, the one person said this. It was a, it was a friend or family member that spoke to them God's truth. So there it is. That's what keeps people together. Is what does God say about this? Now I can tell you this. I just told you how mine and my wife's relationship, we have an amazing marriage. We really do. A great partnership. Not that it's perfect, you know, she's married to me. You know, it's not perfect. You know, but the, but the reality is this, is that, that even though it's not perfect, we've, we're, it's an amazing marriage. And it didn't start that way, though. It really didn't. That's the way it is right now. In the first two years when we got married, I, I got to tell you, we, we both wanted out. We both said, you know what, let's just get divorced. This isn't working out. The first two years of marriage. I, I, st- I still remember I went to the pastor that married us and said, hey, is there any clause in the Bible that says I can divorce somebody if they're a little crazy? And he's like, are you talking about yourself? You know, I mean, because I was like, okay, this isn't working out. You know, what is happening here? You know, and, and we both didn't want to be together anymore. We're like, you know, we're no, this, is, this is too hard. And so finally, when I talked to that pastor, I said, look, so what do I do? He's like, so are you, okay, so what are you doing right now? And I explained to him the stuff that we were doing. And they said, okay, well, it's because you're doing it your way. He said, are you ready to do it God's way? And I'm like, I think so. I'm like, okay, if you're willing to do it God's way, I, be, I guarantee you can fix this. Now, back then, I did not believe it was fixable. Here I stand now, 19 years, one month, and two days later, saying it was fixable. That's how good God is. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So, and really what it came down to, it wasn't how we felt. It was whether we were going to follow God's principles or not. That was it. That was it. So if we were committed to that, that's what changes everything. So that's what I'm hoping is going to happen with you today. That today, if you're here and you're struggling in a relationship, you're starting a relationship, or, or you're just trying to you know, learn how to continue to grow together in that relationship, that it all starts with understanding, here's what God says about how to have this strong marital relationship. And, and, and if I, I want you to walk away with one thing today, okay? We're going to talk about this one thing for the next few weeks. We're going to show you how to live this thing out, which is the next thing there in your notes. The one thing that makes a relationship work is out of Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. Now, if you want to read at home later on, we're going to be doing through, the, through this series, we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 through 33. But today we're going to focus on 21 and 33, and I'll explain to you why here in a little bit, okay? So verse 21 is where it starts. It says this. Here's the number one thing that you can do that that makes every relationship work, including your marriage, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Now, the word subject, it literally means to submit. Submit to one another. The actual Greek word is hupotasso. Hupotasso means to be put under, to consider the other person more important than yourself. It literally means to be unselfish. There it is. You see, people get all bent out of shape going, oh, well, you know, the Bible talks about women submitting to the husband, and what does that mean? All, we're going to talk all about that. I'm going to tell you what it really does mean, and it doesn't mean what you've been taught that it, that it means. If, if, if you're looking at it with anger, I promise you, you're not looking at it right. I promise you that. You know, so, but this actually starts off, before it even says anything, it says that we must all submit to one another, that we must all be unselfish to one another. That we must all consider the other person as more important than ourselves. That's what this means. It means that the number one thing you could give your spouse is this. Unselfish love. There it is. Unselfishness. You know what the number one destroyer of of a relationship is? Number one destroyer of any relationship is this. Selfishness. Selfishness is the number one destroyer. If all you're into that relationship is what I get out of it, what I want, what I want, what I want, at some point that person will go, you know what, that's a moving target. I just can't hit it every single time. I, you know, you people will give up. 
So because of that, it's unselfish love is what does it. That's what makes a great relationship. And Jesus actually modeled that for us. Jesus showed us how to have this towards other people. I mean, I mean, if you look at Christ, I mean, again, if we're a Christian, and the Bible says that if you're a Christian, you are a follower of Christ, it means that you follow in the life that Jesus led. And as Jesus lived, lived and loved people, listen to what he said here about how we know that someone is a Christian, about how they love other people. In John chapter 15, verses uh, 12 and 13, it says this. This is my commandment. See, not my suggestion. Not, hey, if you have some time, if, you have, you know, if you're feeling good today. You know, but this is my commandment. This is what I'm telling you you need to do. That you love one another just as I have loved you. Jesus loves us unconditionally. He says, greater love has no one than this. That one laid down his life for his friends. That one would lay down his own wants, his own desires. You know what? I want to tell you this. Jesus did not want to die on the cross. Go, you, all you got to do is go look at the Garden of Gethsemane. You can see the anguish that he felt. You can see that he literally was sweating blood. He actually said, Father, take this cup from my hand. You know, so the reality is Jesus didn't want to go through it, but he willingly did it. Why? Because he loves us. Because love is unselfish. See, he showed us how to do that. Now, let's admit, it's hard to do that, especially when we're angry at the other person. It's easy to have unselfish love when everything's going great. When we go, they're so great, they brought me coffee, and they did this, and oh, this is awesome. You know what all we're doing is we're being selfish because we, they're so great because of what they're doing for us. But the reality is this, truly is this, is that, is that we've got to go give them unselfish love. And it's hard when they make us angry. Who here knows that it's hard to do unselfish love when they make you angry? All right, yes, those are all people telling the truth. Yes, absolutely. It is hard to do that. I got to tell you, I'll be honest with you, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be nice when people are mean to me. I don't care who it is. But yet, the Bible says that we're supposed to love as Christ loved us. And we're, if you think about it, our sin is what put him on the cross. And yet he loved us enough to sacrifice for us. And so I step back and start thinking about this. When you look at the verse, let's go back to that verse that the, in the key text right there in the box. It says, be subject to one another. It tells us the motivation behind it. See, the motivation behind submitting to one another, be, be, behind being unselfish towards one another, is in the fear of Christ. That's the motivation. The motivation isn't whether they make us happy. The motivation is the fear of Christ. Now, what is the fear of Christ? The fear of Christ, the actual Greek word there is the Greek word for reverence. Reverence literally means a love, adoration, and respect for, and a, a proper fear of. It's kind of like my kids. My kids love me, they respect me, and they have a little bit of fear if they're being bad, right? So, so that's what it's actually talking about, that we have this reverence for God, that we say, we're going to do the right thing, God, because of this relationship that I have with you. The motivation behind being nice to this person is because God has been so nice to this person right here. That's the motivation. See, th now what they are is they're the object that receives the gift that God has given us that we are now giving to them. See, God has given us unconditional love, so now we can unconditionally love them. So what God is asking us in this is this, is that if we truly love God, we will obey him. Obey means action. Action, you know what, I promise you this, and you know this if you've been a Christian for any time, that God will ask you to do things that are tough sometimes. And, and this is one of the toughest ones, to do the right thing when someone else is not. So what this is saying is we love them unselfishly. That's the Christian life. If you think about it, a Christian is an unselfish person. I mean, turn over your notes, look at that, look at that verse up there in, in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 verses, uh, it's actually 3 through 5. Sorry, that's a, mis, a misprint on my part. Philippians chapter 2 verses 3 through 5, it says this. It says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Isn't that what we just said? That's what it means. See, it says, do not merely look out for your own personal interests. It doesn't say you can't look out for your own interests. It says, don't merely look out for your own interests. Don't think it's just about what I get out of this relationship. Okay? But then it goes on. It says, but also for the interest of others. So you look at their interests. You look at the things that are important to them. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in the one who modeled it, modeled it perfectly for us in Christ Jesus. See, that's what this is talking about, is that we, 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 as Christians, we're supposed to love one another. We're supposed, supposed, supposed to serve one another. Now, let's admit, I actually put a question on here. Why is it easier to live this way with strangers than with our spouse? Have you ever noticed that? How easy it is to, if someone sins against you and they say they're sorry, you're like, yeah, okay, but it can drag out in our marriages. I still remember this one time my wife told me this. This was years back. She said, hey, babe, can I ask you a question? I was like, sure. She said, why is it that when people have conflict with you, you can handle that and, and you can deal with it and you can let it go pretty quickly, but you hang on to it with me. 
And I was like, why you got to bring that up? You know, I, and I was like, I don't know. I don't know. And so I did. I had to go back and check my heart to go, why? Yes, why is it that it lingers so long? You know, why is it that when someone else sins and they ask you for forgiveness, you can say, okay, we'll move on. But when your spouse does, it lingers a little bit. You're kind of hurt. You're hurt more of it. Why is it that you can look at irritating things on someone else and you kind of go, yep, that's so irritating. And you can walk away, whatever. But if it's irritating your spouse, it eats at you. And it grows. And it grows. Why is that? And I realized why. It's because once we get comfortable, see, think about it. The, those same irritating things were there when you were dating. It really was. It's just you love them unconditionally at that point. You said, you know what, I'm going to accept them as they are. And then once we've been married for so, so long, what ends up happening is, is you start looking at those things and you start going, I don't like the way those things make me feel. See, it just went from loving them to now how I feel. It becomes us centered. And I got to tell you, it's a trap we can all fall into. I fall into that. I have to constantly ask myself like, you know, hey, why? Did, okay, Kim did this. That makes me feel like this. I'm like, why? Oh, it's because I'm, spo I'm spoiled. That's why. Yeah. You know, and, and so that's the thing is we have to constantly go back and check our heart. Because as soon as that relationship now becomes you centered, I promise you, it'll fail. Because if that person is trying to aim to hit what you want out of them, and it, that relationship will fail, because here's what's going to happen. They're going to hit what you want, and then what you want is going to change. You know why? Because people change. So because of that, now what you want is going to change. Now they're going to try to hit that. If they hit it, guess what? You, people change, so now you're going to change. Now you're going to want something else. You know what that person's going to do? They're going to say this, I can't make them happy. I give up. See, some of you right now are going, oh, dang. Yeah, I mean, yeah you, we've been there. Listen, I got to tell you, I've been there. I've been there. See, but here's the thing is that in a relationship that stays unselfish is a relationship that says, you know what? Yes, there's this thing in their life. Maybe that thing is holding them back from being the person that God intended for them to be. It's holding them back from the relationship that God wants them to be. So our goal should be not to have them just make me happy, but I want them to be the best person that God created them to be. I promise you this, that if that person becomes the best person that God created them to be, you'll be satisfied. I promise you that. Unless you got a jacked up mind. But if you have the right heart, I promise you, you will be satisfied. So Ephesians 5, truly, as we go through the next several weeks, it'll be all about the attitude and the gift that we can give people of unselfish love. So the question is this. If unselfish love <clears throat> is the answer, you know, what does it look like? So let's look at what that is right there. The next point is what unselfish love looks like. Let me get some water real quick. Sorry, those allergies are getting to me. All right, so what unselfish love looks like. Now, what we're going to do is that was verse 21 that we just looked at. We're going to look at verses 22 through 32 uh, next week. We'll start those as we get into the details of this. So today's going to be kind of a bird's eye view, okay, a summary of what this is. So what the Apostle Paul did is so awesome. In verse 21, he starts it. Verse 20, uh, 22 through 32, he actually goes into the details about husbands and wives. In verse 33, he says, now let me go ahead and sum this whole thing up real quick. So that if you know, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to do kind of the summation of this whole thing, okay? So here in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33, here's the way he sums this whole thing up. He says, nevertheless, after I've explained all this stuff, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself, that you need to care about her needs just as much as you care about yours. And let's, let's admit, sometimes that's hard to do. And it says here, then it goes on, it says, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. There it is, the two most basic needs of a person that we sacrifice and we respect. That's what it's saying. Sacrifice and respect. That that's the way you can unselfishly love someone. That Now to respect Here's what respect means, okay? Because too often people go, okay, to respect my spouse, respect my husband, I have to make sure that, you know, pretend like they're perfect. No, this doesn't mean lie to yourself, okay? I mean, no one's perfect. The reality is this. I'm going to tell you a little secret, okay? Your, your spouse is not perfect. Whoever you're going to marry is not perfect. And neither are you. Okay, so yeah, neither are you. None of us are perfect, okay? So the reality is this, is that, you know, to respect someone, what it means is this, is you, you look at their good qualities. Focus on those more than the negative ones. Doesn't mean the negative ones aren't there. That's what, you know, you should look at your negative ones, and we'll talk about this next week, as, as opportunities to help. Because my wife and I, we are so different. If you talk to us, we are so different, so different. I love that about my wife. You know why? Because the things that she is strong in, I'm not. She balances me out. And the things that I'm strong in, she's not. So I balance her out. That's what a marriage is. And think about it. Those differences are great, but yet there are times when we go, I just wish they were more like me. I wish they liked the things that I like. No, you don't. 
No, you're not, you're not that nice of a person. You know, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You know, but, but seriously, you know, the, the thing is this, is that we're supposed to appreciate those differences in each other. So look at those things, those areas that, that, that they need growth as an opportunity for you to help them grow. That's how you respect. Now, sacrifice, here's all that means. To sacrifice means that you give up of yourself to meet the other's needs. You notice what I said there? The other's needs. Not all their wants. That's the key. Because I've seen people where they're just like giving, giving their spouse everything they want, everything they want. I'm going, why are you doing that? They're, you know, if you give a child everything they want, how, what, how does that child's attitude become? Yeah, yeah, they, be, they become so selfish. You know, they become spoiled brats. I'm telling you, people do this to their spouse. They give them all that they want. And the reality is this. It's okay to give them what they want if what they want is right. But here's what I realize about God, okay? About God, you know that God loves us more than anyone could ever love you. Period. God loves you more than your spouse could ever love you. God's love is way more complete than that. He loves you unconditionally. And, and so no one could love us more than God. And God always gives us what we need, but he doesn't always give us what we want. Have you noticed that? Why? Because God knows best. So, so there will be times when maybe your spouse wants something that they shouldn't have because they can lead in the wrong direction. You know, I've seen this happen in, in, in various ways. One way I saw was how uh, the, a spouse wanted to make their spouse happy, whether it was a husband or a wife, it didn't matter, but they, they wanted to make them happy. So they said, hey, let's go buy this thing. And it's very expensive. They couldn't afford it. So they get into debt. And now, now they're trying to figure out payments. Then they, then they have issues with finances. And on the next thing you know, they're like drowning. And now they're arguing together because now, remember, what's the one of the, 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 the big, Google, the biggest one that, that, that causes divorce? Money, yes. So now they're breaking apart because of this issue with finances. I actually had somebody a long time ago, this was crazy. They came up to me and said, hey, you know, I want to talk to you about this. And they started talking about how um, their spouse wanted to become a swinger. If you don't know what that is, I'm not going to explain it right now, right? But, okay, well, swingers, you, you swap husband and wives. And I was like, what? That is this, what? And they said, well, that's what they want, and I want them to be happy. And they said that if we do that, it would actually bring our relationship closer together. They're divorced today. So there will be times where you say, you're kidding me, right? Right in the throat, bam. No, I'm just kidding, don't do that, don't do that. No, the Bible says don't do that. You know, but seriously, the thing is this, it, it amazes me the things that people will get into. Why? Because they just go, I want to make them happy. No, no. You want, you want to help them become the person God created them to be. That's your number one thing. We'll talk about that more next week, all right? So that's the key. And, and so, so when we look at this, we talk, okay, that what, what we need to do, the way we show love and sacrifice truly is, is to, is to care about their needs above our own. Let's admit, we all look at that and go, yeah, but. You know, because we could all come up with buts, right? Yeah, I see what you say. I should respect my husband, but you don't know my husband. You know, you don't know all the stuff that he's done. Da, 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 da. Hey, you know what? Here's the thing. I don't know your husband, but I, I can guarantee that if you've tried hard and you pray about this, God will give you things to praise him about. Maybe start focusing on some of those things. You know, yeah, but, you know, why should I sacrifice for her? She doesn't, put, you know, fulfill my needs, so why should I do things like that? I, I'll go buy myself what I want. You know what? Because doing the right thing is, is it's because of our relationship with God, not because of the relationship with that person. Remember, the motivation is here. They're the object of it. They get to receive the love that God has already given you. So, so we can all come up with excuses. Let me tell you something. I am one of the greatest excuse makers. I really am. I didn't go to the gym or eat healthy for years. And my wife would tell me all the time, babe, you need to work out. Babe, you need to, you need to keep, be healthy. And it wasn't because I was losing my abs because those were gone for a long time. You know, but, but the reason she was saying that is because she wanted me to be healthy. And I would go, okay, babe, I'm going to go next week. Next week, I'm going. And then I'd be all ready. I'd get my gym clothes ready. I'd get up, and the alarm slept. I was like, oh, I hit snooze twice instead of once. Man, it's going to be a 45-minute workout. Nah, that's not, enough. that's not enough time. It's not worth it. You know, and then, and then she'll go the next day, babe, are you going to go to the gym? Oh, well, it's Tuesday. You can't start on a weird off day. It has to be on a Monday when you start, you know? I mean, you can come up with all kinds of excuses on what not to do, you know? Oh, yeah, you know, oh, I'm going to eat healthy. Oh, but you know what? I, I, I got called out, so because of that, I couldn't do that, so instead I ate, I ate, you know, all this junk food. We can come up with all kinds of excuses. That's what we do very well. And I got to tell you, I was a huge excuse maker in my marriage at the beginning as well. I still remember when I talked to that pastor, I said, hey, I want out. I want out. And he said, well, tell me about your relationship. I said, okay. So I said, here's the things. I mean, here's the things she's doing. She, he's like, can you tell me the things that you're doing? And I was like, I'm an angel. Because oh. you know, hey, we know we all try to paint it our way, right? And, and then as I was talking to him, I, I, he said, okay, well, here's what I want you to do. And he says, instead of focusing on that, here, I want you to do this. Just buy her something nice. Just, uh, doesn't have to be expensive. Just something 
And I'm like, she doesn't deserve it. Do you know what she did? And I, I could make excuses all day long. And he said, you know what? You're not doing it because of her. You're doing it because of your relationship with God. And God says you sometimes need to love the unlovable because right now you're not very lovable and God still loves you. And th- I got to tell you, that's what began to change it all. We stop making excuses and we say, I need to give this person that unselfish love. Now, there are four barriers that stop us from giving someone that love. There really are four barriers. So we're going to end off on this note today. So let's look at what these four barriers are when it comes to a God-centered marriage. The barrier number one, here's the reason. These are all warnings, okay, warnings of what not to do to be careful about these things. Number one, barrier number one is scripture is often misapplied. You know, and we're going to show you what this scripture, Ephesians 5, really does mean when it talks about the wife be submissive to the husband. We already talked about that right now. You know, what, what it actually means here about being subject to one another. Before it even gets into that, it says we need to be submissive to each other. We need to be subject to one another. We need to be unselfish towards one another. We're going to get on. So if you're here and you, you hear that part and you get angry again, it's because you don't know it right. I promise you next week, ladies, be here. It's going to be an amazing lesson that shows you what that verse really means. See, because for too long, people misapply that verse. And I remember when I was growing up, you know, my, my dad was very domineering, very abusive. And I remember he used to yell at my mom. He would tell her, you do it because I said so and I'm the husband. And I'm going, what? What? They, and you try to point to scripture for that. Whatever happened to the stuff we read just before and right after? Because just before it said, be subject to one another, be selfless towards one another. Why not that part? Or why not the part that true love is about sacrifice, the husband sacrificing for the wife so the, the wife and respects her husband. See, none about that. So misapplied verses are huge in destroying relationships. So we're going to talk about how to apply it correctly next week. The second one is this, is the culture we live in. The culture we live in, you know, tries to push you know, God completely out of the picture, completely out of where, you know, out of relationships, trying to break relationships today. Today, relationships aren't about sacrifice and respect. Today's relationship is about this. Get your own. Get whatever you can out of that relationship. And if they don't make you happy, if they're not Mr. Right, look for another Mr. Right. Guess what? Guess what? There's only one perfect person ever, and he died on the cross. Everyone else that you get in a relationship with, is not going to be Mr. Right, Mr. Perfect. We're all broken people. So the reality is this, is that instead of trying to jump, 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 what we do is we understand, here's where God wants me to be, and here's how I can help this individual when we're in that relationship. But culture says no way. Culture says that verses like this oppress women. And and it's wild. Again, I'm going to tell you next week, it's the opposite. It's the opposite of that. Okay, we'll talk about that next week. And they talk about, well, you know, in today's culture, we, we've evolved. That's what people say. We've evolved. We're not where we used to be. Marriage isn't that important is what people believe, which is wild because, you know, if you look at the time that Jesus came into the world 2,000 years ago, it was worse than today. The marriage unit was completely worse than it, than it was today, what Jesus walked into. So let me go ahead and read for you some quick history on what Jesus walked into 2,000 years ago. It says, when Jesus came to this earth 2,000 years ago, this world was an absolute mess. In a Jewish home, women were regarded as possessions rather than partners. Literally, divorce could be for any indecency. There was one school that said, even if your wife is troublesome or quarrelsome, so even if you just have an argument, you can divorce her. Even if she doesn't salt the food right, you can divorce her. In a Greek home, so now remember Rome was in charge during this time 2,000 years ago, okay? This is what Jesus came in to fix. In a Greek home, women were totally secluded. The fathers were often cruel dictators over their children. And prostitution was an acceptable part of the Greek culture. That's how men got their needs satisfied in the Greek culture. And in the Roman home, divorce had become an epidemic. Women often, remember, so this was written during that time. Women often dated their years by the number of husbands they had. There's records of 10 husbands and eight husbands within five years. Yes. Okay. And then it says, there's one record of a 23rd husband marrying a 21st wife. They've been married 23 times, 20, 21 times. We think sometimes we've got the corner of things not going well in marriage today. But back then, it was a mess. Jesus came into that world, and he taught people the truth about marriage and how it was supposed to be. He taught people the truth about who men really are and about who women really are. He began to raise the standard, and it changed the world. It literally changed the world. It changed marriage. Why? Because Jesus came to show us that he values everyone. Everyone is valued. God sees the potential in all of us, and so 
should we? See, that's the key. Jesus came into a much worse place than we see today. Marriage was way more broken in that society than it is today. So if Jesus can step into that society and fix it, he can step into ours and fix it. But it requires us to follow what Jesus says. And we're going to get all into that as we go through this series. And then the third barrier, the third barrier is this. The way most marriages are now patterned. See, when we get married, here's what we do. Oftentimes we get married and we go, you know, I married that person because I loved them and they were perfect and they made me feel so good and they made me so happy and it was so great and gave me butterflies in my stomach. No, that was just rotten pizza. You know, but still, you know, but the reality is that's why people get married and they don't realize that, that when you first are going to get married, if you're single, this is perfect for you, okay? Start trying to process and walk through the pattern of what your marriage is going to be based on God's principles. Because if you don't pattern your marriage, you will follow whatever pattern was handed down to you. I promise you that. You know, this was the conflict that my wife and I had in the first two years. See, she grew up in a single mom home. I grew up in an abusive father home. And, and if you don't learn a brand new pattern, when you get married, you actually start living out that pattern when things happen. So, so in, a, in a single mom home, you, you were raised up. Look, you don't need a man. At some point, if, they, if something happens, you can, you're perfectly on your own. And then uh, over here, if you grew up in an abusive home, a yelling home, you know what you start to do when conflict happens? You start yelling. Now you start yelling, that person says, I don't need a man, what happens to their relationship? Exactly. Because we follow the pattern that was handed down to us. Instead, we've got to learn God's pattern. And that's what we're going to talk about. Again, we're going to get into the details of the next few weeks. And barrier number four, so we can get finished up for today, is we are intrinsically selfish. We can't forget that one. That is huge. Every single one of us, we are selfish, intrinsically selfish, inside of us. i got to tell you, that's a sin that comes back to me. I hate that sin about me. Because I, I, I'm a giver. I love giving to people. I love helping people. I love serving people. But there are oftentimes in my mind, I come back going, but what about me? What about me? See, some of you, they're like, oh, yeah, that's me too. I mean, see, the, the reality is, is that selfishness, that, that, that is one thing. That's a sin that will keep coming back, and you have to fight against it. There's an amazing quote. Listen to this quote by a guy named Warren Wearsby. said this. says, the root of all marital problems is sin, and the root of all sin is selfishness. There it is. When it, we start just thinking about ourselves, I promise you it's the beginning of the end. But I believe... James, the brother of Jesus, said it best in James chapter 3, verse 16. Listen to what it says right here. It says, for where jealousy and selfish ambition, so selfishness exists, there is disorder and every evil thing. See, where there's selfishness, that's, that's the thing that breaks everything apart. And you can't build a relationship, a lasting relationship on that. That if your relationship is based on, here's what I want, I promise you, it is a quench that will never be, or it is a thirst that will never be quenched. I promise you that because you'll just get thirsty about something else. But instead, God says it's about us unselfishly loving the other person. And one of the questions that people have is this. Okay, if it's about me giving, me giving unselfish love and me doing for the other person, what about my needs? What about, you know, when are my needs going to be met? First and foremost, I want you to understand this, that that's where I was 17 and a half years ago. That's where I was. I said, well, what about me? Because that pastor told me, he said, hey, you want to do this right? Here's what you need to start doing for your wife. Just buy her some, buy her some flowers. Buy her something nice. I'm like, oh, she doesn't deserve it. I, I don't care. You're not doing it for her. You're doing it because you're, what God has done for you. Do something nice for her. Okay. So I started doing nice things, doing nice things, and doing nice things. And I got to tell you, at first it was angering because it wasn't being reciprocated back. I wanted it to be like, you know, balloons fall from the sky. You know, I wanted it to be fireworks going off because I was like, I did this nice thing. And instead she was like, Thanks. Girl, you better start dancing. You better start doing this. I so do something right now. You know, and, and I, but I got to tell you, I, instead I said, you know what, God? I'm going to do this because, because of my relationship with you. You love me when I was unlovable. So I will love somebody with, with unconditional love when I feel they're being unlovable. That's what changes everything. Here I am now, 19 years. I started planting seeds over there. We're reaping the benefit right now. We have an amazing marriage. And that fruit just keeps on growing. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk more details about how you can make that happen in your life. But the question is, is what's our next step? If you're here today, first and foremost, if you're married, your next step, start looking at ways to unselfishly love your spouse. Don't always just think about, here's how they make me feel. Here's how I feel. Here's how I feel. Go, you know what? I need to care about something about them. 
Just focus on that. Yes, still feel. Yes, they should still. I mean, if you both do it, I got to tell you, I promise you this, that if you both fulfill what God wants in your, in your relationship, you're both satisfied. It's going to be amazing. But start focusing on them. If you're single, if you're divorced, hey, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Stay focused on God. Focus on his principles. Look at how you're going to build. Look at what, you know, what you're going to move forward. Look at whatever pattern. If you're divorced, the pattern that didn't work, don't do that again. Albert Einstein said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Let it go. So now we look at God's principles. If you're single, you can start building on that right foundation. Put that pattern in place now. But the most important thing is this, is if you're here today and you don't have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, we're talking about how to unconditionally love other people. We can't give unconditional love to someone else if we haven't received God's unconditional love in the first place. You can't give something that you don't have. The very first thing is to understand you're a broken person and God loves you anyway. You're not a perfect person and he values you. Maybe today, first and foremost, what you gotta do is just say, God, I'm ready to give you my life. I'm ready to accept your love. I'm ready to understand what you want for my life and I'm ready to follow you. You know, it's step by step, God. Maybe if that's you to here today, please come talk to us after the service. All three pastors will be right up here. We'll be more happy to talk to you about what that step is in your life. And again, we're going to be talking about some incredible, incredible stuff over the next few weeks about, about marriage and what God says. Be here. This is just part one. This is just the intro. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. We're going to get into some details over the next few weeks. Next week, we'll do part two of Happily Ever After. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you so much for today. Again, we thank you so much, Father, for all the people that are here and the opportunity that we get a chance, Father, to, to learn about the most important relationship outside of our relationship with you. Help us, Father, to understand the unity that we can have, that when we do things right, that when we plant the right seeds now, we're going to reap the benefits later, Father. So we pray that if there's anyone here today struggling with any, with a, with a marriage or a relationship, Father, that you know, that they know that if they unselfishly pursue that relationship, that's what makes it, you know, it makes everything come together. Father, I pray that you give them the peace and the comfort to know that right now, for all of us, the best is yet to come. We thank you so much. We love you with all of our heart, Father. We praise your son in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, I want to thank you so much for being here, church. I love you, church. Hey, don't forget, number one thing, get your, get your tickets for Valentine's Day dance. All right, I'll see you guys. Love you, church.